Hello everybody or whoever's watching. Um, my name is Harper and I am a, a master's student at the University of Alberta. Uh, specifically, I research how science is integrated into natural resource legislation in Alberta. Uh, I would also like to start by thanking Kevin for setting up this really awesome series um, and you for tuning in, of course. Uh, so I just want to start by saying that this lecture is not going to be about the history of science or the philosophy of science. This is an explanation or a walkthrough of my methodology when it comes to handling science in sociocultural research. I've included a zip file with a bunch of papers spanning different topics uh, from different time periods uh, that led to a lot of this uh, like line of thinking that I currently have. So I'll leave it up to those authors to really explain the background. And this is me kind of taking what I've learned from those academic predecessors and putting it into something um, a little bit more concrete and actionable. Uh, one of the first questions that we're going to look at is just with post-truth and things like alternate facts and, well, this is my reality and that's your reality, kind of like what happened? Um, in sociocultural research, something like relativity or acknowledging that everybody does experience the world in their own way. We have different truths about the world. Um, but this, this is called uh, very loosely relativism. However, uh, when relativism you know, became very much a part of the postmodern movement of the 90s. It went very much unchecked by realism and unhinged, uh, my words, by the subjective versus objective dichotomy, which is something that we will be revisiting later in the presentation. Uh, <laughs> realism is the acknowledgement of that external reality. There is a consistency outside of us and our perceptions. And that realism is kind of like if I were to pick up a rock and throw it at your face and it hit you, uh, you I, without even looking at or taking in your reaction, I would know that it would hurt because there is a consistent truth uh, that exists between us. Uh, there is an external reality to our perceptions. So one of the things that comes with this kind of post-truth um, perspective is whose science is correct and is all science the same science? Um, and whose science should we listen to? So we like to talk about science or proponents of science will often talk about science as if it is all the same while at the same time saying that it's different and it can be very confusing um and because even sociocultural researchers will write about science as if it is a consistent thing and it's the same across the board but we know that it ab absolutely is not there are consistencies and there is something that makes science science there is a concrete consistency there but we can't just treat it like a monolith. So if it is not all the same, if it does have this incredible diversity, how can it all be so, how can, how can we know what's right if it's all so different? And personally, I think that that's not a well-constructed question. I think that's a bad question. Um, I will ask you instead to consider a cookie. Uh, there are different types of cookies. We have chocolate chip, sugar, ginger cookies, etc. And we know that across cookie types, we still know what a cookie is. There are certain characteristics and features of a cookie where if we see one, we can say, ah, that's a cookie. Even if somebody has done something absolutely wild with it, we can still say, well, this is the basic infrastructure of a cookie. And there are people who bake cookies and people who buy and eat cookies. There are people or, you know, you don't have to buy them, I guess, to eat them, but consumers and makers, right? Users and doers. So scientists then, science would be kind of like a cookie. There are features that when you see it, even if somebody's doing something absolutely wild with it, is recognizable as science. Um, and then other knowledge types that are recognizable as those knowledge types. And the baker then would be the scientist. 
So the baker can also consume cookies. Um, but, you know, some people are professional bakers or professional scientists and others are amateurs. Now, please remember that this is a very limited metaphor and that the criteria for becoming a professional baker are obviously very different from the criteria of becoming a scientist. Um, and these things exist in real life in different ways. Um, I just feel like I have to put that um, disclaimer there that this is a limited metaphor and about where it kind of ends, but hopefully we get the idea going forward. Something in a lot of sociocultural research, especially sociocultural research that uh, works with very concrete real life things like policy, like uh, co-management practices or um, uh, public health impact, ass impact assessments of major industrial projects, um, they will often um, put as equivalent Western knowledge and science, as if those two things are interchangeable. And ultimately, these this is like saying that a broccoli is a, is a cookie, when we know very much so that these are not the same thing. Um, and it, it's just, it's, it's a false equivalency, and they're treated as if they are synonyms, uh, which, as I'll show, they are not. So in a lot of sociocultural uh, applications and discussions of uh, practical um, kind of contexts of scientific things, uh, especially with natural resources in Canada, in the United States, just basically in any colonized um, part of the world, there's indigenous knowledge and then there's Western knowledge. And what this does is it casts indigenous knowledge as pan-indigenous. It's this monolithic block. It is, it is not just a square that I drew on the, on the chalkboard. It is uh, literally just this block knowledge. And what it does is it sets indigenous people up as being unable to authentically participate in science without giving up their indigeneity or that type of knowledge. And then with Western knowledge as being held as equivalent to science knowledge or as being inherently scientific, uh, it is also monolithic. It is also very homogenous in the same way. When we think of the portion of the world that uh, comes to mind when we say Western, there's no way that everyone in those places thinks the same way or has the same, you know, types of knowledge across the board. Uh, and by having it be like Western knowledge is scientific knowledge, therefore any kind of knowledge making done in the West is science. And it gives this moral alibi for beliefs and behaviors that are not scientific as science. So obviously not a fan of that. Um, even when people try to reposition it like this, where science is between indigenous knowledge and Western knowledge, there are still, I don't know if you can tell, but I tried to make the dotted line in Western knowledge uh, or a little less solid, but this is pretty much the tone of how thing of how these discussions go, where science is still very much blocked off from indigenous participation as indigenous people as being in this indigenous like it, honestly, it's talked about as if there is a a pan indigenous mindset, um, which is you know not good for so many reasons. Uh, but it is also monolithic, and science is still considered as Western. Um, when we kind of pull science away from Western, the idea of Western knowledge like this, we also realize that we don't really know what Western knowledge is when we say that, um, other than, so uh, yeah, uh, science plus something else. Um, Western really doesn't have a lot of meaning other than uh, colonizer and colonized or in, and colonies. So still, this is not the best model. Uh, everything is still held as very static, very homogenous, very unmoving. Um, people cannot flow between these states of mind or these knowledge systems. Um, and even when we try to pull science further out uh, into its own block, uh, again, the same problems with holding Indigenous knowledge as this monolithic block, it's pan-Indigenous and it uh, prevents anybody with, held within that block from participating in scientific knowledge or even Western knowledge uh, in an authentic way. Uh, Western knowledge, again, zero meaning, meaning other than countries uh, that have colonized and the colonies. And in the literature, there's very little kind of definition as to what this actually is, whereas uh, there's a lot of ethnographic studies of 
different uh, indigenous knowledge types. And then having science as this separate block, it assumes two things that are verifiably false. Um, the view from nowhere, which is one of Chapin, Stephen Chapin's papers in the zip file that I have attached, um, that assumes that science is in this objective reality as a view from nowhere. So it gives, a again, a moral alibi to everything deemed scientific. And as we'll discuss a little bit later on, science mindset, that's not a mindset that you can actually occupy all the time or fully. Uh, so you can't just be in that mindset. And it also, having this uh, kind of setup implies that we can fully and only exist in one place at a time or at one, one mindset at a time. So obviously still not a fan of that. Um, I've broken down, uh, I've gone into the literature obviously for my own research. And I tried to determine how exactly is science and science referred things, uh, how are they referred to as, how are they studied, how are they treated? Uh, because we we as researchers tend to use the same language kind of just across the board of science is this, science that, study of science, anthropology of science, um, where science is not really a useful word. Uh, so I've broken it down into four categories. The first is a word. And it is a very slippery word, as we'll discuss later on. Uh, right now, I just want to kind of go through generally what my four categories are. Uh, but yeah, it is a very slippery word. Um, and the words used in science or scientific rhetoric or sci the, that persuasive speech uh, is often rhetor scientific speech is rhetorical speech, as in it is persuasive speech with authority. Uh, and we'll get into how that relates to the scientific method. And I wrote not very useful because when it is inauthentically used, the meaning of the words can change, even though the word itself and the general kind of idea infrastructure is the same. So the word can then act as a prismatic bucket that you can put meaning and implications in um, and have it transmit um, that different meaning out from within it. So, but we'll, we'll get more into that. Science is also not only a word, but a process. So science itself is not a belief system, um, not really truly a full belief system. It is a practice, an investigative practice. Um, and it is basically instructions on how to encounter a phenomena in a specific way so that we can cope with the external reality to have it be predictable. And we'll get into that a little bit later. But it is a word, it is language that we can speak with. It is a investigative practice that prescribes how to encounter phenomena and how to orient ourselves towards something. Uh, and it is dynamic and ever-changing. This is a process that is constantly being debated. There are constant features. So remember, like, we know a cookie is a cookie because of basic things about it. There are basic things about science that is consistent across the board. However, uh, a lot of these ways of doing things are constantly uh, under critique and debate um, with the goal of improving those methods and ideas and theories. And this, the scientific process is ultimately a communal process. There is not a single scientist on earth that acts alone because of the peer review process. So even if they don't have an entire lab group, which is not realistic, uh, or they don't have, you know, like funding committees, which again, not realistic, uh, or they're not involved in any kind of uh, community debates, which is not realistic, there is peer review. So in order to get published, in order to have your work validated as fact and truth, um, there is this peer review specifically with experts in that field. So somebody has to, uh, and again, this is very generally, and of course, just inundated with privilege and uh, a, a very complicated and troubled history on its own, but you have to be deemed an expert to be a part of this peer review process. And because of that kind of esoteric nature of you have to have this knowledge um, and go through these initiate steps, uh, it is proving yourself. So your knowledge has to be proven in order to be able to authentically critique and review um, other people's findings and knowledge. 
And science, we use it as a fact. So a highly precise statement about the world, this is an information packet um, saying something like, oh, well, this is the science of vaccines, uh, is as in this is the scientific explanation of vaccines. Uh, it is very, very confident, but also has a flavor of uncertainty that does not translate well to other aspects of our life. S Daniel Sarowitz uh, in the zip folder has a very good article about this that I refer to quite often. Um, that confidence is very, very solid. So that little scientist person is up on that plinth that is very solid. It is very useful, highly specific, highly precise, but any try to go move any which way with that fact and it doesn't always apply. So we cannot really, it's, it's very difficult to speak in generalities, but we can start to, by keeping in mind this high, um, this intense precision of science, we can see how those facts are blended in with other facts generated from other knowledge systems. Sometimes that's a very interesting thing and it's syncretic and sometimes it is very overtly harmful. Um, again, we have to use our, um, our, our judgment with that and I will get to that particular aspect of it a little bit later. And the fourth one is a technology. The technology can be easily divorced from fact and practice. Um, because it can leave the scientific lab like this microphone here um, or the device that you're watching this on. You don't actually have to know anything about how that device works, how it was made. You don't have to know any of the thermodynamics, the physics, um, and literally anything uh, in order to use it. And that's why I do indicate that it can become magic. A lot of scientific words are like artifacts of science. So that would be the technology. Sometimes it's a fact that you can hold in like a packet. Sometimes it is a word. These artifacts of science, both material and immaterial, um, they once they leave the realm of that authentic science, um, and right now I'm not using this microphone in an authentically scientific way. I'm just speaking into it. I'm using it in a recording, in a presenter kind of way. Uh, so in this way, it is a magic thing <laughs> that captures my voice and sends it to you. And in this way, it exists um, on its own kind of relationship, uh, evaluation, arena with every other thing in my life. Uh, science is extremely unique in the history of human knowledge because um, of a very, because of the process, because of how it is done. But when we think about how people integrate facts into their mental modes and into their daily lives of how, how they choose to um, pick up and put down things that they want to accept and reject, uh, then science does uh, by its nature become like everything else. It is not on the same sociocultural hierarchy like as everything else. Like we definitely have knowledge hierarchies. Um, but when I say that it becomes like everything else is it's just like it's in the arena kind of fighting for attention with everything else. Um, and that's not necessarily what makes it special. It's the process that makes it special. So then there's also using science versus doing science. Uh, so an electrician will use the facts, words, and technology of science. Uh, but when it comes to the doing of science, uh, to me, this is the process. So this person can have, um, you know, an experiment running at home with uh, a controlled, a responding and a manipulated variable. Uh, they can have a null hypothesis that they are working with, um, but because they are not a part of that peer review process, this would be an inauthentic process. It doesn't mean that they're doing something wrong. Um, it just drawing a line between authentic and inauthentic uh, is something that Cooter and Pumphrey do in their paper in the zip file. Uh, it's one of my favorite papers where it looks at popular science versus uh, like academic science um, and looking at how facts move, facts, words, and uh, these kind of processes and participation moves between authentic and inauthentic processes. So, or inauthentic speech or authentic speech. And there's also a lot of work in anthropology working generally with inauthentic and authentic statements. Um, that's a whole other lecture, but uh, once we go down to the minutia of or, or splitting up science into tech, facts, words, and process, and then into authentic versus inauthentic, um, again, as informed by a lot of linguistic anthropology, which we will get a little bit further into, 
uh, things become a little bit easier to handle. And then by considering some of these things as artifacts of immaterial or material artifacts that people can take and uh, embed into other aspects of their life, into other knowledge systems in their life and different moral evaluations of their lives, uh, then we can kind of begin to see how these things not break down as in like crumbling up a cookie until it's crumbs, but uh, getting a camera with a really good resolution and zooming in on that cookie until we can see every granule of it while it is still uh, remaining whole and something that we can deal with. Um, but yes, yeah, so, but this means that there is a, a not, I don't want to say like measurable, but there's a, a concrete limitation to what we can say of like, oh, I'm doing science. Well, there are criteria to these things that matters and is real. So then we consider a medical doctor, uh, and this is something that's very prominent now um, in so many issues, <laughs> but I'll try to focus here. So um, again, a medical doctor will use the facts, technology, and words um, of science, but the process that they are uh, engaging in when there's a patient in their office and they're doing a uh, clin clinical examination and a diagnostic, that is a medical process. That is not the same as a scientific investigative process. That is the medical process. The medical gaze is its, um, its own kind of deal. Um, and so they can have all of those without participating in any critical cognitive and community process. So one question to ask a doctor is, what are you do? What is your practice for keeping up with um, new medical science? And if your doctor cannot say, well, I subscribe to this journal or that thing, or like if they don't say that I like to read this journal or whatever, uh, or I go to these conferences or something, if they can't answer you, then it's like, okay, well, they might be working with old facts and old words. So again, they can be authentically engaging with the facts, technology, and words that they know, but unless they are engaging in that community, um, that communal part of that process, it's very difficult to say that like, oh, I am a scientific kind of person or thing, or I'm engaging, I'm doing science versus I'm using artifacts of science. So I also want to consider the metaphor of the mind purse. Um, so we have these facts, words, this technology floating around in our mind purse, but the facts, words, and technology of science are not the only ones uh, that we have floating around in there. So if you think back to those blocks that I drew, where with Western knowledge, it was like, what is this? With a lot of people like myself who would fit into the category of Western, um, it's like what, what is when you start to pick apart uh, what the facts, the words or language and the technology of science are, you take those kind of artifacts of science of our use in daily lives or our practices, and then you look at what's left. Uh, and it's like, how do we talk about this? How do we define this? How do we do this? Um, but all of those things are all floating around and jumbling in our mind purses like loose change. Um, and so this medical doctor, while still maintaining an authentic engagement with scientific facts, technology, and words, and an authentic engagement in the medical process, uh, might have some misogyny floating around in there. Um, so misogyny that comes from a knowledge system that is knowledge and opinions and orientations about the world, things held as truths about the world based on, again, a knowledge system, a patriarchal knowledge system uh, or a patri patriarchal value system uh, within a knowledge system of this society. So when they reach into their purse and they pull out words and technology and facts in their medical process, that misogyny can stick to it, much like when I'm rooting around in a bag and I pull out something covered in chocolate from who knows when, um, it can come out kind of sticking together. And that's how these things kind of stick um, to each other in our minds. And so that's when we can get things uh, like a refusal to provide contraception or a refusal to uh, be vaccined or to support the idea of vaccines from medical doctors. Sorry, I went ahead. Um, it's because even though they are, they can be auth authentically engaging with some facts and some um, words, science is not a holistic or, or, or be like belief system. There are bits and pieces of it um, it, it is less 
uh, aggregated and less cohesive than we like to talk about it. And we like to talk about it as if it is this block thing that if I am a science person, then I must accept everything that is scientific and I must be keep keeping up with all of the scientific things that I must be doing all of these things. This is not a possible way to exist. <laughs> Even as, um, sorry, I work with a lot of STEM people uh, or science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. I think that's what the T stands for. Anyways. Um, and this is just not a realistic way of existing. And I like to say, because I like to rhyme, that we consider science to be a nouned and bound thing. That when we say science, it is this block in our head and it has it is homogenous, monolithic, it is nouned, it is a thing on its own, and it is bound up in that idea. And we need to dissolve that and separate that in our head, which is and which is why, you know, considering it like this is why we spiral into those vortices of what is real, because this concept of science is not a realistic way. This is not how the practices, um, the uh, language, the knowledge of science, this is not how it behaves in our within us. This is not how we behave. This is not how we interact with things. Um, this is just not reflected in our realities. As And again, as variable as our realities are, there are consistencies with how this expresses. And this noun and bound way of thinking about science and treating science those are the ones where I just find those spirals into this oblivion of what is truth, what is real, oh no. So once we start to uh, not, again, like crumble science down into nothing, we don't need to look at its atomic bits. We need to zoom in on the pieces. We need to enhance our resolution. It is kind of like in those CSI episodes where they're like, zoom enhance and then all the pixels become clearer that's not possible in forensic technology but it is possible as a metaphor uh for us anyways next slide uh so this is why even though language technology fact and process can be nouned they are much more easily allowed to be dynamic they are much more easily allowed to be uh focused on um in again, just being more highly specific and precise and pedantic about it, um, we can handle it a lot better. Um, the concepts themselves uh, allow us to see how this very complicated thing that is not a thing um, behaves and exists in our lives. So these are also not... Uh, not <laughs> exact representations. These are approximations because really all of these things um, are floating around um, and, and you know, interconnected with everything. So this is where the imperfect nature of this model goes. This is a conceptual model um, and a guide for critical thinking, not necessarily a uh, a definition of what this thing is, because again, it is not a thing in and of itself. So these would be more similar to reference points. So like a physicist, if I wanted to measure the speed of something, I would have to define what my reference point is. If I want to measure the speed of a car, um, if I am inside the car and the speed of the car relative to me, if I am my reference point, then the speed of the car is zero no matter how fast the car is actually moving in relation to everything else or in reference to everything else. If I am standing on the side of the road and the car is going past me, then the speed of the car in reference to myself is going to be more than zero because it is moving and I am not. So these are reference points, places where we can ground ourselves and say, okay, from this reference point, this is how we're going to talk about this. From this reference point, this is how we're going to talk about this. And I, I do have a background in science, my first degree was science, and I was very fortunate in my first year uh, to have a physics professor who really broke down a lot of these thought patterns. And he was a very thoughtful person too, and he spoke in very poetic ways, I think by accident. But that doesn't matter. What matters is that I also learned about something called the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. We don't need to know what that principle really is, but uh, for plasma physicists such as himself, that really applies to him. Anyways, um, if you're studying subatomic particles, particles you can't possibly ever see with your eyes, you can only ever detect um, and therefore calculate 
it's speed or it's location or like exactly. So you cannot know both at once. And this is not an explanation for how thinking works. It's not like saying, oh, well, our thinking is just like this physics principle. What it did is it made me think, okay, there's a slippery thing that I can't quite pin down. So maybe I don't need to be able to define it and hold all of the information about where ex- what exactly it is in my mind at the same time. Maybe I need to know one variable. So this is where it's kind of like, okay, so these are the four main ways in which the literature for me across sociology, anthropology, uh, co-management, uh, public health, uh, psychology, um, a, a lot of these different kind of studies on people, both Western, non-Western, Indigenous, um, all these categories of people. These are the four aspects of science that kind of come out as a pattern for me. And so these are our reference points that I would really, really, really like academia to be more specific about because (laughs) this took me a long time to be like, okay, it is, it is the way they're talking about it. And it's not just me not understanding these things. So I want to delve a little bit deeper into each one with a little bit of an explanation of the theory, just a little bit of theory, just a scooch of theory with words, uh, the category of words. Uh, I pull on a lot of the work of Foucault uh, in the ar- his archaeology of knowledge uh, refers to a discursive practice. So science, if anything, um, is a discursive practice. And I'm saying that de- in a declarative way because I do think that we have sufficient evidence for that in sociocultural um, studies of what we call science and scientific practices and communities and blah, blah, blah. I can't believe I just said blur, blur, blur in a lecture. I'm so sorry. Anyways, I do think that there is sufficient proof to declaratively say that science is a discursive practice. Prelly, um, in the uh, 1981, 1983, uh, is Lawrence Prelly, The Rhetoric of Science. Uh, he summarizes a ton of uh, literature that describes the rhetorical structures of science. Science is communicated, but also validated through rhetorical or persuasive speech. We must gather evidence. We must present this evidence, and we must convince our peers who are operating with Within the same mindset as ourselves or the same paradigm, which we will get to in a second, um, in order to be considered legitimate. Uh, so again, these words are a performance of authority and validity. And because science can do things like cure and treat diseases and illnesses and conditions uh, that, you know, bring incredible suffering to people and, you know, help that out, we can go to space. We can do things that we that is fully unprecedented um, in humanity before. Um, It is a truly unique thing. And therefore, the process and the investigative um, process and the, the predictive and explanatory power that that has, not power necessarily in the sociocultural sense, but um, the robustness of that is what lends the words and language um, authority and validity as something real and true. So there's authentic engagement with that language, which would be, you know, peer review, experts communicating to the public, and then inauthentic um, uh, expressions of that language, which again, it doesn't necessarily mean incorrect. It just means that it's, um, we're drawing a line between when that diffusion out of those authentic spaces, uh, when it becomes maybe more popular science, but also when it becomes persuasive and manipulative. So Bakhtin is one of, um, my favorite authors to refer to. I, uh, it's dense and, I'm summarizing a lot in a little tiny picture here, but basically um, the light refracting through that prism is the metaphor that Bakhtin uses of language refract the meaning, sorry, our meaning um, refracting through our rhetoric as we change, we, we kind of change the, 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 implicit meaning of words. So we have dictionary definitions of words, and then we have sociocultural Um, meanings and definitions of words. And 
So when you have an, a word, a scientific word or a piece of language coming through, uh, somebody will frame it within a rhetoric or a persuasive argument and then bend the meaning of that word uh, to a new meaning. Uh, so this is where I have the term biological inferiority, which is often thrown around for um, different racist arguments, different misogynistic and transphobic and homophobic and all these kind of phobic arguments based in people's bodies. Uh, so again, we know that this is not an authentic you know, reference to biology. It's using the authority and validity of scientific uh, knowledge and words and that predictive and explanatory power through its words, but it is refracting it towards a new meaning that is not defined by scientific criteria, but by a socio-cultural patterning um, and a socio-cultural uh, criteria outside of the scientific criteria. And I am talking about sociocultural and scientific in different ways, only because that is how we conventionally understand it. And I don't want to get too dense. But that inferiority, um, inferiority in a scientific sense would be something like early microbes, uh, like three billion years ago, did not metabolize sufficient energy to support uh, multicellular systems until cyanobacteria came along and then started reducing oxygen. And then we got m metabolic systems um, out of the reduction of oxygen that could support multicellular systems. However, that is still a sociocultural uh, value landscape of my own life and experience and existence, where I'm assuming that it is inherently better to be a multicellular organism. So no matter what we do, we are constantly, uh, again, this is just an example of how, no matter how we approach science, it will always, always have um, some of our sociocultural patterning in it. And it never, ever truly exists outside of any of that. Um, but Within the very strict constraints of that biological paradigm, something like racial inferiority or um, sex-based or gender-based inferiority, those were considered scientific at one point. And so then those people doing science, so again, it's those not just using science where that refraction can happen, but also doing science where meaning can, where we can find that refraction as well. So yeah, so just, again, just because somebody is a scientist does not mean that those other meanings aren't sticking to the words uh, that they're saying. So that's why we can't just assume that, oh, well, science is science and sociocultural stuff is over there. It's the mind purse with the sticky things in it. The process, again, we have those specific um, characteristics and it is always dynamic and always developing even around those specific characteristics. But the part of the process that I really want to drill in on uh, is described by Prelly's uh, book that I have in the bio uh, bibliography is that it is a paradigmatic way of thinking. So Prelly uh, introduces two systems of thinking, paradigmatic and terministic. Paradigmatic is a system wherein there is a singular reality, whereas terministic is many realities can exist um, in a valid way at once. Terministic is usually where we are all the time. Paradigm is what we use in scientific thinking or the scientific process. Um, and it, you can think of it as a recursive loop of a singular reality that scientific processes spit out data, we interpret it, we say this data means X, Y, Z. And then in that rhetorical process of persuasive speech, we go to other experts and we say this data means X, Y, Z because of this. And it's like we put it through the test of that paradigm. And if it fits the paradigm, then it is acceptable. And if it doesn't fit the paradigm, then we must investigate what went wrong with our experiment or what might be wrong with the paradigm. So Again, it is a highly specific way of thinking, and it is therefore, because it is so precise and highly specific and only allowable for a singular reality, it is unsustainable. And when I say a singular reality, it means that it is coping with an external reality because there are many realities that exist within us at once, and I will get to that in a little bit. But we we encounter realities with many different mindsets, um, maybe at once, maybe you know, 
oscillating between them at really high rates. Who knows? We can't really measure those kind of things. But we have a lot of methods of encountering things. And a paradigmatic way of thinking only allows for a singular reality. So even when we are engaging in a paradigmatic system, um, we never truly like solely occupy that singular reality because we bring so many different realities within ourselves in with it. And because it deal, it is, it is such an incredible way of coping with an external reality in highly specific ways. And that's where that high precision. So if you remember the scientist on that pillar, that high precision, this is why it works because we can say very specific things about a very specific thing in very specific situations. And that's why it doesn't allow for a lot of movement or lateral movement within an authentic scientific uh, critique because <laughs> this is a very difficult um, mindset uh, to to cope with. It it can only really cope with those highly specific things at once. So it is a very important way of thinking, but it's not always the best choice because there are ways or there are situations where a scientific question is not a valid question, where it is not a good question. <clears throat> Sorry. And so a lot of times when we are asking questions about policy that involve things like climate change or vaccine mandates and stuff like that, uh, is what we are asking a scientific question. Can this be actually addressed by scientific experimentation and paradigmatic thinking, or are we asking a moral question that is informed by facts? And so Sarah Witz breaks this down very well. Halliday is an author, a legal scholar, actually, uh, who breaks down uh, different spheres of expertise. That one is definitely worth reading, I think. So when we say that scientists can't agree on a solution to climate change, this is a very disingenuous way of speaking about um, this whole situation because the solution to climate change is a policy-based thing. Uh, it is a moral question and it is not a scientific question. Scientific experts cannot really say, well, you need to implement these sociocultural actions, these political actions, these economic actions. Um, they can, they very much can operate within their lane and they can inform us uh, with what is and is not possible within a scientific context. But this is also where we get a lot of that misalignment of what does uncertainty mean? Because for a scientist to answer a question with absolute certainty, first of all, never happens. I'm going to go out on a limb and I'm just going to declaratively say it never happens because for a scientist, enough information is not enough. Um, there is always there's always uncertainty. There's mathematical uncertainty. Uh, there's inherent experimental uncertainty. But then there is also the themselves recognizing that they don't have per perfect information about something. Um, again, I'm speaking in very, very broad terms. There's going to be a scientist out there that's like, of course, I know everything. And like, sure, you do. Um, but again, this is a question of staying in an intellectual lane um, and a more and an expertise lane of what are you actually talking about? What is the situation and is our orientation towards the situation the best one? Um, a scientific, like I say here, a scientific assessment cannot handle the complexity of social illness because that is a terministic question, not a paradynamic question. We need to be able to work with multiple realities at once um, and not be and not try to sink into just a paradigmatic way of thinking or trick ourselves into thinking that we can have that singular reality way of thinking because uh, we all bring different perspectives to the table. We'll get to that in a little bit too. Oh, sorry. Um, a fact is a packet of information. It does not always need to be explicitly scientific vocabulary. So it doesn't always need the words of science. It can be embedded in somewhere. But basically, we'll start with the obvious. Something like things go down when dropped is not a scientific fact. we I'm going to, again, be pretty confident in saying that everyone who's ever lived has dropped something and it goes down when dropped. And we've always known that there's some kind of force pulling us down. There's something making things go down. That's not really a scientific fact. Gravity um, is now a scientific word, uh, but it's also used poetically. And then, of course, the term, the, the statement, however, gravitational acceleration on Earth is approximately 9.8 meters per second. And I do say approximately because gravitational fields is not consistent across the Earth. Um, and that is approximately an average. Um, but 
you get the idea of the precision necessary in scientific speech or authentic scientific scientific speech that is the scientific fact that gravitational acceleration on earth is approximately 9.8 meters per second squared so we have to be very precise with can uh, a, a ground truthing question here is it's like would people in the in like even just the 1300s would they have known that this would happen in the world that if i drop something it goes down yes well then the concept of that is not new but thinking of gravity as carried on a particle you know transmitted as a hologram through a couple dimensions that's you know a scientific you know kind of way of thinking with things vaccines use genetic material of a sickness again that is a scientific fact it's not used in the most precise language the most authentic language but it is um, still aligned with the scientific understanding of what vaccines as a technology are. Um, somebody saying, if genetic material of sickness touches mine, as in my genetic material, uh, then I am contaminated. For me, nope, that's not, it's not just an inauthentic use of scientific language, like the first one. It is just not in line with scientific uh, like the facts of science, the facts produced by science. So there are missing facts in there and you can see how the conclusions drawn between those missing spaces is filled in by other knowledge types. Again, sometimes not necessarily a bad thing, but you can see in this specific case, it's filled in with moral values of contamination and purity. Um, and so the idea and the fact that genetic material exists and people knowing that fact that genetic material is in them them. There's genetic material in a thing that is bad and, and gross or bad and negative. And if that touches my essential kind of material, um, there are value systems that are placed on those things. And it's in that way that these facts can be taken out of that authentic scientific uh, space and embedded into other knowledge systems and, or other value systems. So then we have statements like, this river is a person. This is not a scientific encounter with a phenomenon, but it does not mean that it is wrong. In a biological frame, frame set, um, this would be like, this H2O is a homo sapiens. Like, no, it's very clearly not. And when people say this river is a person, they know it's not a, like a homo sapiens, right? Like, it's, yeah. So it's like, we have to also uh, like include other methods of encountering the world as authentic. This does not mean that evaluation criteria is always authentic. So that's when we say that people saying, well, this is, you know, if someone says this is the way that I encounter the world, therefore it's valid. Um, you know, a Maori person saying that this river is a person is not the same as an anti-vaxxer saying, well, this is my reality and I'm, this is my experience of vaccines. So we also must look at the criteria and the criteria of this evaluation. And this is in my words, um, I've translated it into like white people understanding. Um, so basically it would be like this river is an important thing that deserves the legal protections and considerations of personhood to protect its complex well-being. So this is more of a legal orientation towards something. Um, and we can't just say, oh, well, or sorry, this is where that false equivalency of Western equals science and indigenous equals not science and therefore the opposite of science, like those dichotomies are just very harmful and useless ways of thinking because they just lead people in circles. Um, and I've read, you know, material over, like research over the decades where I'm like the same problems are popping up, not just like policy wise, but in the research, like why are we still on this? Um, Anyways, that's a whole other rant, but this is also not something that is very far off from a lot of Western thinking. It is just Western valuation um, and how we relate to the world in these moral ways because we do have corporations having personhood. Um, so again, we're not encountering it in a scientific way, but we're encountering things in you know these, uh, these other, un for us, undefined ways. Danger, as we're wrapping up here, um, no need to startle you. Um, I know you must be so scared by this, but the subjective versus objective. So basically objective mean, like we've all heard like you have to be objective. This person's being subjective. Um, 
objective is not real. We, there is an external reality, but we will never, like that is the objective reality. But the usage of having this dichotomy of saying that's objective and this is subjective within us, objectivity will never exist in us. We cannot enter into that space because we are perception. We are these things, these perceptions and judgments happening all at once. We as a self, as a concept of a self, and if you want to spiral, we can spiral. Um, this is not something that is possible for us to do. We will always be subjective and we will never reach that objectivity. And furthermore, subjective is usually used in cases where we're saying this is immoral, this is stupid, this is fake, this is emotional and therefore womanly and therefore bad. So these the, the use of these terms is not... Um, again, these are that slippery language where I find them to be more rhetorical devices and not actual descriptions of our realities that we are living in and the ways that we operate. So objectivity is not, I just, they're not useful terms and I just don't want to use them ever. Objective, I compare to an asymptote, which is a math thing. Uh, so the asymptote would be the dotted line. The parabola is going off into infinity and one would assume that they would cross over, but they never ever do. This is just a mathematical metaphor. Um, for, I guess, the math nerds out there. When I was writing this, I was like, oh yeah, we'll include this math thing. And then I was like, this is an anthropology lecture. No one wants to talk about math here. Unless you do, um, then yes, I would say that it is asymptotic. So instead of, however, thinking of subjective versus objective, because this just does not help us, it doesn't guide us in any realistic way. And in, if anything, it just gaslights us into constantly thinking that we're wrong because we can't ever think in these parad in paradigms, in that way of thinking, in that framework. Um, there's critical thinking versus non-critical thinking. And furthermore, objective versus subjective is more of a passive and innate quality that we assign to things. Whereas critical thinking versus non-critical thinking, that first of all describes the actual process that people go through. Um, and it is much more active. Are you engaging with the cognitive patterns or are you not engaging with your cognitive patterns? And again, constantly engaging with those patterns is exhausting. We don't need to be in that way state of mind all the time. Um, but this is, um, again, just, it's just a process of thinking that is way more useful and way more applicable. So if we just kind of acknowledge that subjective versus ob objective is an obsolete um, and vortex way of thinking, uh, critical thinking versus non-critical thinking, it's way easier uh, to be specific and to pin things down. And it's a lot harder for people to just say, well, this is my reality. Okay, cool. Well, you're not critically thinking about your reality. Um, so again, uh, I did mention that we uh, it was not a cherry pick of word, tech, facts, and process, um, that we're recalibrating the tools that we have. Um, and so again, thinking of these as a reference point, if we start to noun and bound things, so if you find that you are going back into that pattern of nouning and bounding, these are reference points that just situate us as a starting point. Oh no, there's more! What about visualizing knowledge, identity, and understanding of the world? So we started this off looking at knowledge as these block um, kind of monolithic things. So I developed a metaphor. I say this, this is like it's an invention, but basically the way that I describe this is people are kaleidoscopes. The um, the the way the way that our knowledge forms and our outlook or our worldview, all of these kind of things that we use to describe ontology, whatever fancy word you want to use, that is the pattern at the end of the kaleidoscope. And the lenses are all of our different ways of encountering the world. So there may be a scientific lens in there, as authentic or inauthentic as it might be. There would be, you know, maybe a farming lens, maybe a construction lens, maybe a poetic lens or an artistic lens or something like that. All these ways of encountering the world. Um, and as we turn them, uh, the, 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 the picture that we are approaching the world with, that composition of ourselves that we are approaching the world with, um, can be in flux and change. So it allows us to have very specific and consistent parts where these knowledge and belief patterns can be described concretely, but we are allowed to be dynamic with them. And that is um, a metaphor that works across sociocultural anthropology, sociology, linguistic anthropology, psychology. Um, so the kaleidoscopic way of visualizing people 
um, I think is a really good way of working with it. Um, but yes, this is how it is. So instead of defining a knowledge type in a box and putting people in it and then trying to reconcile the fact that that person holds a bunch of knowledge types, just people have themselves instead of having it be an external thing that is a plot that we then fit into, it is something that we in fit into ourselves. So you have a bunch of people walking around and in their heads, you have all of these different knowledge types bouncing around. And within those knowledge types, you have language facts, technology, and processes and it, the, the process of engagement, the process of encountering. And I would be interested to see how in my research and in everybody else's research, really, um, breaking knowledge types down into language facts, technology, and um, encountering process, how that really changes a lot of our approaches to things like indigenous knowledge, which is right now just this pan-indigenous thing, you know, uh, where it is a block solid thing. So taking that from the scientific mindset, moving it more into further trying to describe and therefore handle what we mean by Western knowledge uh, and so on and so forth. And so again, make sure to be grounded in realism. So taking that paradigmatic and terministic way of thinking of having a scientific understanding, but also how can we have an external reality and then multiple internal realities existing all at once and have it be something that we can handle um, is, again, if I have a rock and I throw it at your face, I don't need to know what your reaction is. I can just go completely no sensory after that and know that if it hits you in the face, it's going to hurt because I know that it's going to impact nerves. Those nerves are going to fire in a specific way. And so that's how I know the scientific fact of the matter. However, your experience of pain will be ultimately different from my experience of pain. And we might disagree on whether that's a big deal that I hit you in the face with a rock. You might think it's a big deal. I might think that you might have to get over it. You might say, oh no, it's a huge big thing that I'm bleeding everywhere and I might be like, suck it up. So you have two different realities, our internal realities approaching the same kind of reality between us. So there is... <laughs> things exist basically um but yeah so again the not subjective versus objective because again when we try to identify this pair like the, or i keep saying paradigm this uh framework of subjective versus objective into different knowledge types that are not scientific uh it breaks down we can't fit it in because there are many valid knowledge types that use what we would label as subjective um, but they're still being very critical thinking um, and very unbiased thinking or as, again, asymptotic, as unbiased as we can be um, or as reflexive as we can be. Um, so critical versus non-critical engagement with things, again, it just it can apply to knowledge types and our participation in those knowledge types just way cleaner, way more like, you know, it's, it's more of having like a, a tool that you can apply everywhere. Um, and again, make sure that you are being specific and precise in how you are examining uh, people's language and kind of the conditions of truth. So truth does exist, um, but it's truth under what conditions. Um, so to consider as an example, uh, what is biology in the last like, oof, gosh, I'm leaving this right to the end. Uh, <laughs> I chose the terms male and female. So these are two very slippery language. As a trans non-binary person myself, they aggravate me to no end because I do not fit in them in a social gender way. Um, and I, again, it's like, just because I have certain body parts then I'm assigned into this thing. Um, from a biological perspective as a biological category, because a lot of people do like to default on that, again, as a uh, moral alibi of saying, well, we have to use these words because it describes you know, two types of way in our species or whatever, it doesn't because intersex people also exist. And these are normal uh, physical forms to be. These are normal ways to be uh, in any physical system. And they just are not captured by our language. So when we look at the words, facts, technology, and the process involved in the words male and female, the facts that it is trying to uh, represent the world is the sexual dimorphism of our species. Any species that, um, w when a species, um, blah, 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 uh, reproduces sexually, there will be different productions of gametes. Sometimes, however, we, there are those that 
reproduce uh uh they can be asexual but then that involves hermaphrodite hermaphroditic reproduction is different from uh like asexual reproduction like jellyfish where they grow polyps and bloop off um so again it's trying to also communicate that not only does sexual dimorphism exist in some species it doesn't in some it does um but there are different ways of producing two sets of gametes that are then merged so however this is again not adequately communicated in the language so the process says that between male and female those are two categories that are defined by constellations of statistically significant characteristics and that's a term by joseph hill my supervisor uh not myself um but the constellations of statistically significant characteristics so again it's not a binary the process, the data produced by science shows that it is not a binary, but though from going to the process of that data production and into the words, again, of that rhetorical um, validation process, uh, the, the sociocultural uh, value landscapes and knowledge landscapes of some, from somewhere else other than this scientific process says well there's man and woman so then there's male and female so these words were not prescribed by the process of science but rather by the uh that like the knowledge types the a priori knowledge from somewhere else so this is why now we say assigned female and assigned male these are solid and stable terms that now account for social context and the representative nature of biology as a metaphor of that is constructed about our physical forms. So if we take that external reality, my body is not a biological thing until I encounter it through biology, um, which again is not inherently a bad thing unless that biology has uh, patriarchy sticking to it, transphobia sticking to it, uh, and so on and so forth. But again, what I'm saying that biology has it stuck to it, is it the technology? Is it the fact that you know, IUD insertions are extremely painful with very little to no pain, you know, augmentation or, or you know, anesthetic or anything offered with that? is that a technical that's a use of technology kind of thing so the are the facts interpreted and embedded in our lives along with patriarchal views um so when we just say the biology again that really doesn't tell me a lot of things except for the fact that i need to okay which aspect am i talking about then so for here it's how the words of biology do not represent uh the actual data of you know, like what, what exists in the world. It's within that interpretation, but also biologists now would very much disagree with biologists of 10, 20, 50 years ago. So again, that's where that process comes in and that communal process of is somebody authentically engaging with the new information that is coming out. And so we cannot say when people are using old science, quote unquote, to justify um behaviors and beliefs now that is a moral alibi and we can say well you are not keeping up with science science is changing constantly not because it's suddenly deciding what it wants to do because it's a capricious little like oh my gosh what am i it's a it's a libra Ugh, i have issues with libras anyways um oh oh kevin i can't start my lecture about astrology and the linguistic constructs of it and archetypes Ugh, I wish I could talk to you all day, but uh, we can't do that. I'm probably over time already, um, but thank you so much for sticking with me. This is my email address if you want to clarify anything. Um, but yes, so four categories, critical thinking versus non-critical thinking, kaleidoscopes. And that's, those are the tools. Those are the intellectual tools. So go forth and uh, let me know what you think, honestly.